Okay. Um, just uh, one quick thing. This, um, as the address shows here, I'll, I'll post this at my blog and it's being recorded also. So I will go ahead and um, uh, post it on my YouTube channel too, which will be listed at the, uh, the blog address as well. Um, all right. Uh, so one quick thing, um, I, I have sort of, uh, I guess apologies is probably a strong word since it's not really anything of my doing, but um, Royal Mail from the time the etching, the test etching sheet was shipped until it arrived in my hands uh, was close to six weeks. So I didn't, and it, and it just came uh, the middle of this week. So I didn't have nearly as much time to play with some of the things as I wanted to, but there's still enough, uh, enough material here for you to at least get a sense of what it is I'm working on. And just uh, thank you to George Tolman and Tony Sissons. Um, I had been communicating about some of these ideas for years and I think George was sort of on the same wavelength as I am and I'm excited to share some of the successes as well as failures with him. So uh, appreciate his input and, and Tony's guidance as well, who's done a lot of work uh, himself on etchings. Um, so uh, a little bit, first of all, about what etchings are. Um, there's several steps in the process. It's a pretty rigid defined process and it's used in, in many different industries, obviously including the hobby industry. Um, there's a, a design phase that involves actually creating, um, you know, some type of artwork or drawing that to be used. Um, you have to select certain types of metals, uh, which are some of them have advantages over others, depending upon the, the sizes and details you're looking to get out of the process. Um, the metals uh, are coded um, as uh, part of that. They're, they have to be cleaned. Um, and then there's uh, an exposure, which is a, basically a photographic process. And um, there are parts of the metal that are effectively blacked out. And, and others are not. And that, that's what kind of creates an exposure on the metal. Um, and then it's developed um, as part of that process to, to create areas on the metal that will be removed as part of the etching process. It's, an, a, chemi it's a chemical process and it's different depending upon which metals. And then at the end of that, the, um, the photo resistant that was used to shield parts of the metal from being etched has to be stripped away. And then you're left with the parts after that. Um, so it's it's complicated um, and, and it involves many different steps, obviously, to, to get to the finished product. Um, so I, I wanted to mention a few providers because I know in, in you know our piece of the world, uh, we've, we've had etchings around for a while. I don't know if, Many of you remember Detail Associates. I remember when I was a kid, you would buy their parts and they were, they had this sort of gluey stuff that attached them to like a, a vinyl backing that you had to soak in lacquer thinner to get the part off. Um, Taurus, I remember, was one of the first that I, I can recall to have parts in a freight car kit. They had wood freight car kits that also had etchings in them. Um, Free State, I remember how excited people were uh, his name was Mike, and I'm, I'm forgetting his last name, but he came out with a sheet of Carmer cut levers, which at the time was revolutionary because anyone who had built a Westerfield kit and had the Carmer cut levers break was thrilled to have them. Um, Alchem is still around. Um, that's Bernie Kempinski. Um, Plano is obviously a name we all know. I, I mentioned Plano because I think they're they're ubiquitous, but you know, I, to, to be frank, I I find their details sometimes to be a little heavy handed. Um, and that's probably part of the process they use and the metals they use. Um, Kaiser Valley, if you're not familiar with them, they do a lot of detail parts for diesel engines. Um, they're worth checking out. And then, of course, Yarmouth uh, has, you know, Pierre has um, in some ways become synonymous with etchings for freight car parts. Uh, and it's certainly made um, a lot of, you know, what we are doing now um, that much easier. So. Hats off to him. Um, 
In terms of the the providers, there there are obviously many out there because etching is is a process that's served for many industries. But the the two that um, you know really from the hobby side of things kind of dominate what we're doing. There's a firm called Insight Designs out in California that produces incredibly high quality work, um, but they're also expensive and they tend not to work directly with the consumers um, unless that person can demonstrably you know, show them that they have experience working with drawing and understand the metals and the processes. So um, you know, most of us don't generally work directly with them. Um, oops, sorry. Um, I have worked with them. It's through an intermediary who intermediary who had to do the drawings for me, and you have to pay for that as well. Um, Insight Designs is expensive when you also add in a third party to do the artwork to the to the specs that Insight Designs wants. It becomes very expensive. Um, I will say that when they get something right, um, and I, I will also say they don't always get things right. I haven't been happy with everything they've done for me, but it. It can be amazing. And I, I put that little banker's trust company trust plate image at the bottom there. The actual part um, is less than a quarter inch wide in, in real dimensions. Um, and yet you can still read the, the lettering on there. Um, that was a trust plate that I included in New Haven boxcar decal set that I had uh, years ago. Um, it's, it's exquisite. Um, the, the other end of the spectrum, not in terms of quality, but in terms of uh, working with them as PPD. They're based in the UK and um, they're very much kind of self-service. You have to present them with finished artwork. Um, they will provide guidance. They'll review the artwork, tell you if something's wrong. Um, they've been very, very helpful to me and they're quite economical. Um, uh, when we get further in the presentation, I'll show you a sheet that they uh, did for me of test etchings. It's quite large. I had two of the sheets made and the setup fee and the whole thing was 70 pounds, which was, you know, like a hundred dollars. So it's, um, it, it's really quite reasonable. Um, so why am I uh, sort of going this route? Because I'm, I'm moving this direction for a lot of things and some of it's personal and some of it will have uh, what I'll call commercial applications, but I, I called it the three itties. Um, availability is one, um, and I, I think this was something that Ed Brethwich alluded to in his presentation, that the market for parts like ladders and steps and, and you know, what have you has started to shrink. I, you know, if, if you think back to 20 years ago, there were many companies producing styrene ladders. Uh, the number today is a lot smaller. Um, A-line sill steps, um, the, the most common version they had uh, has gone away as well because of the, uh, I guess the, the tool that they use to make it has, has worn out and they're not gonna make more of that, that particular style. Um, so, you know, we've had to find um, alternatives for things we're doing. Um, a second thing for me is fidelity uh, to detail. Um, there are things as, as my modeling has progressed and matured, there's, there's things that I was probably more accepting of 20 years ago that uh, really don't fit my wants anymore in modeling. So um, etching is a way for me to get that in, in what I'm doing. And then the third thing uh, is durability. And um, particularly things like ladders and steps, um, I'm really less accepting than I used to be of, of using them. Um, you know, you, you, you have a model, you spend a lot of time on it. You know, you can spend 40 hours producing a beautiful kit bash or something, and then you break a plastic step and, you know, the headaches of repairing that and such. So I really want something that's durable and is going to last as, as long as the model will. Um, so some of the parts that I'm thinking of right now, and I'll talk about um, within the context here, are things like ladders and steps, um, certainly brake gear, side sill supports. Um, I, I don't specifically cover them in here, but cabooses, I think, are another great um, place to go because a lot there's there's a lot of nice styrene cabooses have been been made over the last ten to fifteen years, um, and the the place where some of them are lacking uh, is is details like uh, ladders and 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 handrails and things like that. So 
um, there's a lot of opportunity for that. Uh, talk a little bit about tools here quickly. Um, you obviously need a tool to create the artwork. And I use Illustrator for this. Um, I'm comfortable with Illustrator. PPD is very comfortable receiving artwork in Illustrator. Uh, it, it, you know, I, I can do it. I do it directly in millimeters when I'm drawing it up. Um, makes it easy. If you are familiar with the CAD tool or something like that, or a different vector graphics tool, by all means. Um, I, I put parenthetically here, I will, I'll do a one hour Wednesday evening hindsight about drawing for decals and etchings. I've, I've done it before, but um, you know, it's, it's a topic that keeps popping up over and over again. So I'm happy to do that. Um, bending tools and assembly tools, uh, I mentioned, I'll, I'll touch on those in, in the next slide a little bit. Um, high quality tweezers, and this is something I have very uh, expensive Swiss tweezers and they're, they're still, um, I still have parts that go flying and things like that. Nothing is more frustrating than that. Um, so I'm, I'm still working on a, on a good solution for tweezers. And my, my sense is that I will probably end up with something with like a serrated jaw um, that, that can really grip um, etchings. Um, in terms of adhesives, I use ACC mostly. If, if I'm putting down a, a part where there's plenty of surface area, um, I'll set it in place with my 50-50 goo or barge cement, whatever you know, glue you have like that, and then it's 50% MEK. Um, that way I'm, a lot, uh, I'm able to kind of brush it on um, but you still get the strength of that barge cement or goo. And then I'll go back and um, kind of finish things with ACC. So you, you get the best of both worlds in that case. The last thing um, I will say, you, you need a heavy dose of patience, particularly ha if you haven't used small etchings, etched parts before. Um, you're going to have things go flying. You're going to have things that don't work out the way you expect. Uh, experience is great because the, the more I work with them, the faster it goes. So um, that's just another consideration. Here are a couple tools. Um, Yarmouth makes a, a great etched ladder assembly jig, which you can see here, it's that wooden piece. The, there are um, these like slots at different widths, depending upon the, the width of the rungs that, that go into that those ladder styles. Um, I've also made some of my own jigs um, that I'll talk about it another time when when I uh, you know because I will do a follow up to this as I as I get more experience and um, have more thoughts on how things are working out. Uh, and then over here is an uh, uh, an etched uh, part folding tool. Um, I've recently ordered another one that's longer. This is actually a fairly small one. Um, I ordered one that's I think the the longest gate. Uh, is about eight inches long on the one I just ordered. And I had to order it from UMM USA because Small Shop uh, discontinued theirs. Uh, so an, another thing, and we will get into some pictures. And I know I'm going through a lot of text, which I tend to do at the outset of my presentations. Um, you have to follow some rules with this. And PPD is very good. I'll show you their rules. But it's a process and there are certain things that can be done with it and other things that can't. Um, you know, if, if pushed PPD will be happy to accommodate requests, but you know, it's, it's like the, the person who tries to do too much in a layout, eventually they end up with a, you know, 15 inch radius curve somewhere just because something has to give along the way. Um, it's better if you just know what the properties of the, the metals are and what can and can't be done and work within them rather than asking to, to bend certain things because it's a chemical process. Uh, it, you know, there, there's, it's only going to come out a certain way. And if you ask them to do things that can't be done, you're going to end up with, with things that either don't etch fully or don't etch enough or, or et cetera. So probably better to just follow the guidelines. Um, I've included in here PPD's guidelines. They're, they're absolutely fantastic. If you follow them, uh, you're going to have good success. And you know they they talk about kind of minimum sizes. Certain things have to be depending upon. Um, some of them are absolute, like 0.18 millimeters minimum for for certain things, and some of them depend upon the metal thickness. So this is where you start to getting into that art of looking at well, what metal should I use 
to achieve the objectives I'm trying to do. This is on their website too. So, um, and they're happy to answer questions. Um, you know, they show things like this. For instance, uh, I'm assuming you can see my cursor moving around here, but on the example at the left, the one with the red X, um, you have a blue line, which uh, is meant to signify a half etch on the back surface. And then adjacent to it is a red line, which is a half etch on the front surface. Now, if you think about it, if you do a half etch from one side that meets a half etch on the other side, if they both half etch, there's going to be that adjacent edge that doesn't exist because you've etched it away. So, you know, these are the types of things that you need to consider and, you know, put your, your spatial thinking cap on. Um, here's a little bit more of some things, you know, they, they don't like you to have a lot of white space unless it's part of what you're trying to replicate. Um, the reason being that the more metal that you etch away, um, the more metal you have in the, uh, the soup that, that ends up and it could create weaknesses in certain places. So it's better to fill things in um, and cut that away than to leave big gaps in white areas. And then here's a little bit about the, the metals. The, the two that I'm really looking at most are brass and phosphor bronze. Um, you know, you see they can both be done in very thin sheets, 0 0.10 millimeters, which is 4,000, so it's incredibly um, thin. Um, I'm tending to work in the 0.15 millimeter, uh, although I'm, I'm still playing around. So, you know, I'll talk about my experience a little bit uh, as we get into some of the, the tests I've done, but, uh, you know, just food for thought. Um, so here is an image of the test sheet artwork I sent to them. And you can see uh, it's a huge hodgepodge of a bunch of different things. Um, these are all for testing. You know, some of these I already know did not work the way I expected. So I'm going to have to go back to the drawing board and try different thicknesses, di different metals, etc. cetera. Um, you know, I think most of us think of etching sheets as the same thing, uh, you know, repeated across a big sheet that's cut up and, and sold to, to individuals. And, you know, I'll probably get there for certain of these, these things, but this is just sort of to get my feet wet. And I'll, I'll talk about some of these things that you see here um, individually. Uh, here's what the sheet looks like uh, sitting on my workbench. Um, again, there's, there's a lot of stuff there, and it was really exciting to get it um, and start playing around with it. So the, the first thing um, for me are, are ladders. Um, that's really what has driven a lot of my work on this. Um, and I did these ladder rungs that you see here um, almost two years ago now, and they are 0.15 millimeter um, phosphor bronze. Um, you see the, the, the tags between each rung or tread, those can easily be cut through with an X-Acto number 17 blade. It's, it's very easy. You don't need to cut them with wire cutters or anything. That's one of the reasons why I like working with this. Um, the styles that you see here are um, brass styles that um, I had kicking around from, from some of my projects years ago. Um, and I basically just assembled what you see here. Um, and I used wire uh, to go through the hole in the style as well as the hole in the rung. I'm also working with a couple other things, including 10,000 styrene rod, which is very easy to work with. Um, and then I'll show you the other thing I'm working with that I like. Um, but you know, it's a little more expensive. Um, so here's an example of, of one of those um, rungs. Uh, this is a, a custom width for a Tichy um, emergency gun, their 52 foot emergency gun. And you have a prototype photo at left here. And then um, this is the rung that I put in place as well as you can see the, the Tichy rungs. Um, the, the rung I have is actually a little bit smaller than the tissue rungs, and those tissue rungs are, are quite fine um, in terms of their fidelity. Um, and then I've attached them actually using, um, uh, if you're familiar with um, the model motor cars, uh, small parts hardware, these are uh, rivets on posts that they make that I made so that they go right through the, the rungs uh, and you just glue them in place. It's 
you know, it's kind of a, a perfect solution, but they're quite expensive as well. So, um, you know, I think for a lot of applications using wire is probably the, the best solution. Um, here's a, another part I drew up. Um, if you look at the upper right, that sprue, those are the <laughs> drains that come in a red caboose PFE reefer. You can see they're, they're, they're basically blobs. They, they don't have a channel in them to drain. Um, what I did was I took this drawing from a, a car builder's site and drew this curved shape right here. And so I, I put that here. I did a mirror of it on the opposite side and then just did a rectangular section. And that's what was etched. You'll see this, there's this bottom piece where my cursor is. That's what this is. Um, it was introduced uh, a little bit later on, I think in the 30s. So a, a lot of reefers don't have it, but this is what it looks like folded up and it has a post so that you can glue it into the floor of the, um, uh, the car once you've got it completed. Uh, I also wanted to do these uh, PFE um, hatch lever supports. Uh, PFE had uh, on most of their wood reefers, as well as the R40-10s, um, they had this, you know, what, as far as I've seen, is a unique shape. And you noticed it has, at the elbow here, it has a really gentle curve. Um, I wanted to recreate those because I'm, I'm putting together a, a pretty big fleet of um, PFE cars. And then the other thing are these rests here, when the, the hatch was open, that would um, be what would rest um, on the underside of, of the hatch cover when it was opened to, to protect it um, from being damaged. So um, what I've shown here, this is a, a Tishy um, wood hatch cover. The, the red caboose ones are almost carbon copies of these. Um, so I recreated this part um, in, in phosphor bronze. Again, it, it's probably not something <laughs> you really need, but I love the fact that, you know, you have daylight where there's supposed to be daylight showing through. And then here's what the, um, the actual uh, piece looks like that I, would, I talked about in the previous slide uh, etched up. I think they came out really well. Um, brake parts are, are another thing. Um, so what I have here, um, there, there are a lot of these uh, pinhole slack adjusters, and it, it seems like there was, there was almost no commonality in them. Um, so I'll probably end up doing lots of different versions of these. This one happens to be uh, one that was on Northern Pacific 40 and 50 foot boxcars built in the early 50s that had um, straight side sill supports, if you're familiar with those cars. This is a drawing that I had of the part. Um, here's the two pieces etched. And then this is um, the piece that you can see on top here is just this part on the left here folded along those those half etch score lines and then underneath it is this piece here and then here is where it was on the car you see that uh, i'll have to make a little bend because part of it was welded to the bottom of the center sill and then it had a slight um, slope and then it flattened back out here and then this is where that kind of rounded part that i have here is um, I'm, I'm really happy with the way this particular part came out. Um, I've been playing around with clevises and, and this is, um, I just had extra space. I kind of was brainstorming and thought, you know, actually this might be a way to make clevises is to just take this shape like you see here and then put a piece of wire through it and just bend it around that wire like, like shown here. Um, that will also allow you to put a pin through the brake lever and, and make it a little bit more secure um, as they did on the prototype. Um, the pieces you see here, probably not long enough. I'll probably need to make them about another 30 to 50% longer so that when I fold it over, it extends a little bit further out to kind of here. Um, you also see um, I didn't cut quite close enough to the edge of, of this one when I removed it. But I'm kind of excited about those. I'm, I'm, frankly, I think these will end up looking better than the, the turnbuckles that we've been using for years. Um, side sill support sections are something that, um, you know, we, a lot of kit bashing 
uh, you, you need to scratch build these custom sections like you know you see here. Um, this is the shake and take project from a few years ago for the Erie cars. Again, you have these um, side sill support sections that we've been scratch building for years. Um, I had the idea, why not draw them and, and half etch them so that you can just fold them. And so, um, you know, the drawing you see down here is that Erie section um, with all of the various dimensions. So I drew it out exactly as you see here. And then um, you can't really see it in this, but by the way, here's also the, the bolster uh, tab section, which is right here. Um, and then it, it's got the folds on both sides. So it's, it's a channel shape like you see here with um, flanges on both top and bottom. Um, this is the, the central of Georgia um, part and it's overlaid over an old central of Georgia um, sunshine kit and what you see here the white is actually uh, scratch built um, using strip styrene although it doesn't have that you know the channel flange like the piece above it does this is the back side of it um, and there's no reason why these can't be etched with you know holes in all the right places so that you can actually insert uh, an aftermarket rivet in there, or you can put on Archer rivets if, if that's your choosing, or Micromark now that Archer is out of business. Um, so here's a little bit of a uh, case study that I wanted to touch on. Um, one of my first blog posts when I started my blog was about the, the Fenero uh, F29 depressed center flat car. And I've had that sitting here for years. I've been really bothered by the steps. Um, Fenero had these clunky yet fragile resin steps that I knew would never survive handling. Um, there are also these, these load anchors that you see here um, and also here. Um, and by the way, if you can refer to this post on my blog just by going back and searching for F29. But um, those were also parts that I thought would be you know, quite easy to do with etchings. Um, this Carmer top lever, which here looks quite short, is actually has a pretty pronounced bend in it here. Um, and then these brake beams that you see on the trucks here, um, these are not accounted for in the, the FNC kit either. So I, I went ahead and you know, drew some of these things up. Um, they were all drawn sort of by sight. Um, I, I had some dimensions and kind of figured them out, but this is what the, um, the sill step looks like attached to the model. Um, you know, you see it has all of the various parts that the prototype did. Um, one thing I, I messed up is I made these a mirror of each other. So um, the cross piece here, the cross step, this leg should actually go up and this leg should go down. So um, when I make these again, and I'll, this is something I'll probably offer um, as, a, as a commercial um, set to, to detail this car. But um, uh, yeah, so I'll have to flip it around to make sure I get that orientation correct. Um, the other thing that's very cool is um, it actually, the trucks clear completely. So these are would be fully operational. Um, the, the journal box here does not, even though it looks close, it fully swings and, and doesn't hit there. So uh, it's you know fully operational, which is kind of cool. Um, and then the, the brake beam, it, it needs to be centered. Um, as you can see, it's a little far to the right here, but it um, it fits within the slots in the trucks. Uh, you know, it's a, a nice detail and it goes at both ends. You obviously would have a hard time seeing the one that's under the oriented towards the center of the car, but this one would be quite visible. Um, you can also see here's the, the piece of the Karmer lever. These are the um, those um, load mounts that I, I talked about uh, that would go along the side cell. Um, you know, so for some other project ideas out there, uh, you know, as, as we look at what you can do with etchings, you can do signs like cross box uh, for, for um, you know, to put on the layout. You can do um, various blades for signals and things like that, vehicle details, um, architectural items like uh, Jim Brewer in his presentation earlier was talking about that gingerbread stuff you could draw that out and etch it um custom window frames you know if you need a window frame that's a certain size in in you know ho scale which i model in you really don't need that much depth to them um, so there's a lot of things you can do with that 
What I've learned so far, um, I did the, the latter styles in phosphor bronze this time around. I'm going to go back and do them all in, um, in brass. Brass is a little bit softer and it's a little bit easier to fold. Once the rungs are in it and it's mounted, um, it, it will stand up to pretty much all handling. So that's, that's definitely a, a lesson to take away. Um, phosphor bronze, I found, handles all of the detail that I was looking for. So my, um, all of my concerns about what would etch and how it would look and everything have, have been met. So I'm really excited about that. Um, nickel, I'm still, um, I, I haven't dipped my toe in the water with that yet, just because uh, it, it tends to be the, the minimum thickness is still not you know, right for the things that I wanna do. Um, I, I mentioned fidelity detail and everything, you know, all of the tolerance have, tolerances have been what I've wanted. I think I might increase the size of a couple holes literally by like, you know, 0.02 millimeters or something incredibly uh, small. Um, the assembly so far has, has been the biggest challenge. And, you know, that a lot of that comes with experience and working with things and setting up, you know, uh, jigs and such. So that's where I still have a lot of learning to do. And I, I will uh, share those experiences when I do part two of this. Um, what's what's next for me? Um, you know, I have a lot of PFE reefers to do with this ladder arrangement that you see here. Um, all of these fixtures at the top to hold the ladders on, these like, uh, you know, triangular braces here, the, um, the uncoupling lever, that was an L-shaped bracket that was attached to the ladder style, the way that this leg of the ladder uh, attaches to the end sill there. There's a lot of things. I have test etchings here. Um, those are ones that I haven't gotten a chance to, to touch since, um, since things arrived just this week, but I'll definitely be playing around with those soon. Another place that I really see some opportunity is things like the way these grabs attach. If you do a normal grab iron with uh, a nut bolt washer or something, you're going to run into the issue that um, there's nowhere to really to attach the wire unless you, you mount it further up. So I, I think there's a lot of opportunity to replicate details like those. Um, and then this is kind of a sort of a holy grail thing that I want to play around with. These um, Equipco hatch cover uh, levers, um, you know, you see how they have that really beautiful uh, detail on them. Uh, the the HO scale parts that we have today look nothing like that. They're really kind of just like blobs. So I think that would be fun. Um, that's everything I have to cover here right now. Again, I will post the these this file to the blog, which the address is right there. And I will also um, upload this to YouTube uh, once I you know, get it downloaded and, and um, all set for that as well. Uh, if there are any questions. Um, I don't know who's going to tee them up for me, but I'm happy to uh, take uh, them up. I'll, I'll tee them up for you, uh, Ted. Um, one question is, what file type is common for the etching companies? Um, I know uh, PPD recommends Illustrator uh, as, as their default. I think um, I've, I've never you know, discussed this directly with Insight, but my sense is that they're using something more uh, like a, a CAD type application, but um, I, I can't say that definitively. So before I had Illustrator, I sent uh, DXF files to PPD and they were fine with those also. Okay. Um, the, what was the next one here? Why didn't you solder them? Like the ladder. Uh, I, I think, I, think I, I, I may try that. I, I don't think it's necessary. And so I think it would be a, a sort of a further complication. I think for me, it's easier to take a pin with a drop of ACC and just pop it in place. Yeah, I actually tried soldering my first one last week and I'm pretty good with the soldering iron. It's a lot slower and I don't really see any advantage. I, I also think, you know, whatever you're seeing in these photos, you know, I mean, I took them with a professional level macro lens and there's a lot of warts that you might see here that are, you're never going to see on a model because it's just, everything here is magnified with that lens. Uh, next one. Uh, 
for rivets, especially in the size similar, a common practice here is to half edge dots on the reverse side of the piece, which are then pressed out again from the rear using a simple punch or drop rivet tool. This gives you a good result, but a bit tedious. <laughs> I guess so. You understand yeah. like kind of half edging and then using it that to kind of form like form with a punch or whatever. I've not tried that. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a lot of work, that's for sure. Um there's guys that are ready to buy already by the looks of it. Uh, I think that's it. And I guess there's a question. Do you have any Proto 48 models? Uh, you're strictly HO as far as we know, right, Ted? I'm strictly HO, although, you know, if, if there's, a, I mean, a market for etchings, by all means, that's easy. That's one thing that's easy to scale uh, in that regard. Yeah. All right. Uh, I think that's it for questions. Okay. Uh, Whoever's recording could stop. We can. Uh... That was me. <laughs> <laughs>